uh, whatever wing that you need to get facilitated at. And then after a while, they'll send you to the specialized uh, centers by which they'll be able to re-diagnose you just to double check to make sure that what they said was correct. Mm -hmm. And then they get you completely patched up. And that's kind of like what God is doing with these apostolic training centers. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Apostle Andrew said, this is not the only one. There's, as I looked in the spirit in this area, there's a lot of training centers. They go by different names, apostolic hubs, apostolic training centers, revival centers. The point being is that they're new, um, but it's not new. We see that in the book of Acts, which I'm going to get to in a little bit later. Um, but I have an addendum. Um, what, I'm, what I'm about to say is I love the church. The church is the best thing on earth that is on this side of glory. Amen. And uh, albeit we're not perfect, we strive for perfection, but what I'm about to say is what we find in today's situation is... Um, we have this thing called tradition, and this is just kind of like my intro to this. Um, so we have this thing called tradition, traditions of men. And most churches, and I'm not saying what I'm about to say because I hate the church, I'm just recognizing that there are a couple holes in the cloth, so to speak, mm -hmm. that need to get repaired. And I'm just recognizing that God He's got the material needed in order to be able to fix the net. As, uh, as I alluded to a couple, a couple years ago, I drew a diagram on a, uh, on a board, and God is taking the net of the church, and he's linking us all together in one family. So eventually God can send us out so we can go reach the world and catch the harvest of souls. Okay. So in today's world, Many churches, they have their programs, the deacon comes up, and again, what I'm about to say, I'm not bashing, I'm not trying to point fingers. I love the church, and God loves the church. Christ came, and he established the church, but we as the church have gotten off the path. And so in today's world, many churches are having church, they're in at 10 or 11 o'clock, and they're at out at 12, 12, 15. Most of them have three songs, uh, three sermons, uh, take your tithes and offerings, and send you out the door. All, all in the hopes of doing it again next week. And then they pray for revival, and year after year, year after year, no change. And there's no change. Um, as What's really interesting about this is um, I'm just completing my core curriculum for uh, my master's degree at Bible Faith Global. And um, when God gave me this download, um, I was reading um, about two months later after the fact um, the, uh, from Spiritual Authority. Um, the author wrote, the Holy Ghost is fed up with ignorant, malnourished children representing the Almighty. Those are heavy words. Again, I'm not here to say that, you know, we are bad. We just have some flaws. So, Apostle Andrew, about June, um, he asked for some prayer um, about about um, about August, and uh, and so I said, sure, I'll go ahead and pray. <laughs> and uh, sometimes prophetic people we are in the know, and I just keep in my mouth quiet, just getting between uh, me and God and, and praying with Him. He uh, he says, I need to pray for August, and I said, shoot, let's just go ahead and do this because God is on the move. In fact, just twelve month, twelve months ago was it? I was uh, over at the uh, Andrew's house, or the Hill's house, and um, Holy Ghost said, you're going to preach. And then Andrew said, you know, he said, oh yeah, by the way, 
you know, like seconds before um, I was supposed to, you know, <laughs> he said, you're going to preach. I'm like, oh, no, you did. I mean, the Holy Ghost showed me, showed me that, and I'm like, oh, no. And as you know, I'm just a little jittery right now, but please pray my strength to the Lord. I'm, a, I'm just, I, I love the Word and whatnot, and I, I've got a message from God, but, um, you know, it was just 12 months ago, and, um, you know, I preached about the, the Bride of Christ and how, and how well, it's basically marriage, and how, how God loves the church just like a husband loves a wife. And I said to myself, Lord, what are you doing here at uh, Manifest Ministries? And uh, 12 months later, here we are, you know, out on mainstream, and uh, God is good. And so, uh, and so I uh, started praying even some more, and then he, uh, he said, he said, we're going to go ahead and do this and such. Um, in August, he says, I believe that the Lord would have you to bring the word. And I said, okay. I got into prayer, and I said, God, you want me to go ahead and do this? And I got a double thumbs up with green light, and uh, I said, good. And uh, I said, Lord, what, what would you like me to talk about? And uh, he, he inserted inside my spirit uh, the word inauguration. And so I got back with Andrew, and I said, is this what you're talking about? He said, exactly. This is exactly what I'm talking about. And I said, okay, great. I got that out of the way. So check on that list. <laughs> and so um, I said, Lord, I've got about a million and one things to talk about. Aside from this little jitteriness that I've, I've got going on, <laughs> I'm very talkative. You can just ask Apostle Andrew. I, I talk, you know, when, when, when uh, <laughs> I have to, I have to kind of like break the ice here. Uh, my yes took about 25 minutes. Because <laughs> I sent him messages on all the ideas. No, 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 no. I'm, like, I'm like ADHD, you know, on steroids with the Holy Ghost. My goodness, what a combination. <laughs> what a combination. But, uh, but uh, he said, is this the long version of you saying yes? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and, so, and so without further ado, um, I looked up the word. I'm a faith word person. I'm also a um, I'm a uh, key word person. So I hear people's conversations. I read something in the word, and the word of God just comes alive to me. It kind of like jumps off the page, and what people say jumps out of you know. I'm I'm able to look at certain key words. It's how I pay attention. Not that I don't pay attention, folks, but I just pay attention in a different way. And so I looked up the word inauguration. I said, Lord, you know I've got about a billion things to say. What, what would you have me to say? And he told me to go ahead and look it up. So I looked up in the dictionary what inauguration means. It means the act of starting a new operation or practice. It means the ceremonial induction into a position. Mm hmm I said, okay. I said, uh, we have a key word here. We have the word induction. And induction means a formal entry into an organization, position, or office. It also means the act of bringing about something, especially at an early time. It also says it's an act that sets into motion some course of events. And I would like to pray at this point. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. We give you the glory. We give you all the honor and praise. Father God, I ask that you just touch today. Anoint these lips of clay. Give me the boldness and the strength to speak your word as I ought, Lord God. I just pray, Father God, that you would anoint the hearers afresh, Lord God, to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. I just pray, Father God, that you just bless this time, Father God, and anoint our learning and hearing that we may not only hear the word, but be a doer of the word and as well as a hearer. And I thank you, Father God. I decrease, Lord God, and I ask that you would increase. I ask you, Lord God, to, to speak to me and speak through me. And I will be careful, Father God, to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And we all said amen. amen. So I want to I wanna go back to the last part of the word induction. It's an act that sets in motion some course of events. 
And as I alluded to the hospital network uh, illustration, what's taking place here at Manifest Ministries, um, my mentor uh, is actually today at the same time. As we speak right now, he is uh, he has opened his doors. God has blessed him with a um, with a building that he's inviting as many people as possible. And it appears to be church as usual, but what is taking place is not church as usual. An apostolic training center is actually geared, and I'm not going to be talking per se about the structure and the foundation and all that kind of good stuff. That, that's uh, Apostle Andrews. Um, he's, uh, he's been doing a very good job at, at doing that. But what is taking place is that God is raising up these apostolic training centers to steer the church back into alignment. Um, and so when I was praying about this even more, the Holy Ghost gave me the, the title of the message. And when the Holy Ghost gives me the title of the message, it means that he wants to give something directly to the people. Uh, sometimes he gives me kind of like the bullets and a couple ideas here and there, and I kind of like, you know, fill, the, fill in the blanks, so to speak. But not this time. He gave me the title. And so the title of my message is, it's the power of an apostolic center. It's the dawn of a new era. And so seeing that Apostle Andrew has been hitting the apostolic, and at this time, I, I, I was just shutting in, shutting up, and shutting out, if I could ever shut up. Uh, <laughs> um, I was being quiet, and the Holy Spirit was letting me know that he was really dealing with the apostolic spirit, the transition that's taking place in the church between the, the pastoral model uh, that's been the tradition of men for the last 12, 1300 years or so, and God is transitioning us into the apostolic model. Um, and so when, um, when I look at the word, the power of an apostolic center, three key words that stick out to me is power, apostolic center. Well, seeing that Apostle Andrew's been dealing a lot with the apostolic, so we're going to go ahead and uh, not use apostolic, we're going to use power center. It yields power center. And so I was looking up the word center, even going more into this message. And center means it's the object upon which interest and attention focuses. So here we have power center. And the power, um, the power goes to us as being the outside people of God. You know, we are the places that God is building on. And so, going even further, I looked at the word era, and it's really interesting. An era is a period marked by distinctive character or reckoned from a fixed point or event. So here we have apostolic centers going all, they're being raised up all across the land and even in the world. And uh, you'll see in the rest of the message why this is, why this is important. But it's a period marked by distinctive character. So what is inside of an apostle? He has the authority, he's got the right, and he's got the power from God to change the course of history in a given community. That's an apostle for you. And so how many of you know that we're in a uh, apostolic reformation. Actually, we're in the third apostolic reformation. And uh, I see that we have an, uh, a reformation study Bible over here. Um, I'm like, I'm in the right place. <laughs> Praise God. And so the third apostolic reformation. So if there is a third apostolic reformation, there must be a first and second. So this is a terminology that my mentor has introduced to me uh, several years ago, and he was saying that the first apostolic reformation took place with Jesus Christ. When, when he touched toe on earth as he was coming through Mary, you know, his very presence alone initiated change. 
And so we see God. Now we're going to go back. I'm going to kind of like go all over the place a little bit, but please uh, kind of bear with me. So here we see um, Moses getting the Ten Commandments and establishing uh, the law and stuff of that nature. And God sets up shop, the tabernacle and whatnot. And here, man gets a hold of this. And he takes this and he formulates a religion. Instead of taking the, the gist of what God is saying and coming closer to God, they're, they're instituting uh, the laws and the practice of practices of God and they make a religion out of this and so time goes that God raises up prophets he raises up kings he raises up judges all in hopes to bring people closer back to him and then when it comes time for Malachi God is saying no more we're going to put the brakes on I've had enough too much blood too many uh, lambs, too many doves, too many bulls are sacrificed, all in the name of not getting closer to me. And so through Malachi, Malachi said, no more. He who pro prophesies will be slain. God is saying enough. So basically what God was doing, he was creating desperation in the people. The Bible records that in the fullness of time did Jesus Christ come to earth. And so when Jesus Christ come, came to earth, his very presence initiated. He is, according to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1, he is our apostle and high priest. And so his very presence initiated a new era, a new way of doing things, a new, uh, not new in the sense of it doesn't have a foundation. No, he tied the law and grace. According to John chapter 1, the law came by Moses, mm -hmm. but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, as we see, Jesus, he died for uh, us, he paid for our salvations with his blood, and he gave the ministry of reconciliation to the apostles in hopes that he, they would take that word out and spread salvation to all that would believe. And so in time, as we see about two, maybe even 300 years after Christ died, the church was strong. They had apostolic centers all over the place. But Catholicism and filthy lucre, the spirit of religion crept right on in. And here we see history repeating itself. And so but how many of you know that things at this time are different? Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus was the one who paid for our salvation, but he being God, he's going to get a return on his deposit. And so, um, in the course of time, we see Catholicism with Constantine and uh, the Nicaea, not the Nicaea fathers, but uh, with the uh, the Byzantine Empire and whatnot, they they had this 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 thing set up basically where what what's called the fallacy of the papacy. So basically, everything that happens in a church must go through the pope, you know, and that's organized religion. It, to me, it's no different than uh, the mafia. Honestly, it, I mean, if I could just be honest with you, um, it just has a, a clerical cliche to it. But things were different because Christ, he planted the seed of his life into the soil of men's heart. And he gets a return on his deposit. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of time, hallelujah, in the course of time, we see uh, right around AD 1600 with Martin Luther. He gets, now the Bible at this point in time is completed and it's actually now translated into different, um, in different languages. So now at this time, we see Martin Luther coming up, and he pins, I can see, I would pay per view for this. He nailed that 95 thesis right up on the, um, on the Wittenberg church's door, and he says, listen here, church, <laughs> these are the things that I've got against you. You guys, this, 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 you can go ahead and Google it and read it for yourself, but he's basically saying, 
You know, he got a revelation that the just shall live by faith, you know, Habakkuk 2 4. And so he, he was like, things must change. We are not walking how God is wanting us to walk. It's not that he was doing away with the church. No, he was there to reform the church. And that is the second apostolic reformation. But check this out. Going on, we see, we see Presbyterianism. We see uh, Met, uh, what, Methodists come up. We see Zwingli come up. We see Pentecostals, um, the, the rise of the teacher, the rise of the pastor, the rise of the evangelist, all the way up to about 1960. We see Smith Willsworth, we see the Azusa Street uh, uh, Revival, we see the Welsh Revival, yes. you know, the Second Reformation, because of the First Ref Reformation paving the way for us. And so in the course of time, and I know I'm a little on the long-winded side, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm setting the stage right now. I'm getting all the props together because once I get all these things in place, yeah. it's going to go rather on the fast side. But I need to do this in order for it that you may be able to have an understanding of where I'm coming from and also what I believe that the Lord has given me. Yeah. And so now we see around 1960 to 1975 or so, we see the uh, emergence of the prophet coming to the surface. Not a lot of books out there aside from the Word of God. And so these, these prophets started writing books. And then in the course of time, we see the emergence of the apostle. Again, same thing. That gift is being reinitiated back to the body of Christ. Not a lot of books. So they spent a lot of time pioneering, paving the way for manifest ministries, for made in the fire ministries, made, you know, uh, Kingdom Empowerment, uh, Apostolic Training Centers, and uh, other Apostolic Training Centers such as that, they paved the way for what is now called the Third Apostolic Reformation. And so we are making history right now. Um, and these are going to be read when we all see Jesus in glory. We're going to were you the one that did this? Or I remember reading about you. It's we're in the greatest, I believe, of all times. And so, without further ado, if you have your Bibles handy, please turn to Ephesians two nineteen through twenty two. And when you have it, please say Amen. Now I'm going to read out of the King James Bible, and if you're reading out of Another version, that's okay, I'll pray for you. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We all speak English, right? Amen. Hallelujah. So Jesus initiated the new era. And so Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, mm -hmm. and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, mm -hmm. in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, mm -hmm. in whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Now these are these are familiar passages. Um, I'm sure we've heard this. Probably we probably can quote this uh, in about six or seven different other languages. A lot of us here in the room are are astute uh, learners, and that's that's really awesome. But I want to bring your attention to um, verses 20, where where this where Scripture says that we are built upon the foundation. You know, foundation here is a very key word. Foundation, it translates into revelation. We're built upon the revelation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And so what we see here is we see the apostles and prophets now who are uh, the, the foundational gifts to the body of Christ receiving 
um, core revelation from Jesus Christ himself to be able to build the church as the way that the uh, church has been designed per Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So everything that they do in, uh, in, in their ministries is Jesus. Mm -hmm. it's, what's interesting about this word is it, uh, in, in the Greek is the word familios. Mm -hmm. um, and it means something to put down. That is a subtraction of a building. Like this, this, uh, this building here has concrete. Mm -hmm. Well, this would be a familios. This would be the foundation mm -hmm. for which the four walls and then all the, all the nice things we have in this building are built. And so the, the church is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, much like how a building is built on the foundation of the concrete. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about this is that the milias, we get the word theme, the English word theme. Mm -hmm. How many of you have gone to a theme park? Mm -hmm. And so, like, right now, all the craze right now is, is Marvel. You know, you could say it's just marvelous. <laughs> And so we have the theme park of, you know, uh, Spider-Man or the theme park of the Hulk or what about the Avengers? <laughs> you know, let's march. Let's go do this thing. So when you go into this theme park, you're going to see everything Marvel, one facet or another. But check this out. That's the way that the church of Jesus Christ is being built through these gifts, or I should say through the revelation of Christ through the apostle and prophets. So when the apostles and prophets, they go to preach and minister and lay hands, it's all about Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. So that way, that way, once the foundation is set, once that foundation is set, then they can grow up by the spirit. See, this thing is not a natural thing. And that's where the spirit of religion has twisted over the generations. And sometimes that spirit of religion takes hundreds of years, but he works on their minds. And the whole purpose of an apostolic center is to get back or realign that which has fallen out of place. Like plumbing. I don't know if anyone has uh, any plumbing experience. If you've got a claw, you <laughs> Praise God, Joshua. Amen. So you get a you get the plumber out there. He diagnoses. Oh, well, you got a you got you got a, a clog. So he gets his tool. Boom. Um, other times, you know, you got water backed up or whatnot. He says, well, you need to get uh, a new piping system. So he goes in there and does the piping system. He doesn't do away with the house, but he just replaces that, which is not functional. Amen. Hallelujah. And so here we see the church now being built now in line because the emergence of the fivefold ministry, and especially now in these last days and times, we see the emergence of the apostles and prophets being set into their rightful place because it's the revelation knowledge that they receive from Christ that is going to be able to give instruction and correction to the rest of the body of Christ. One person can say that the gifts of God inside of each and every one of us is a filter to be able to take the word of God and translate it in a way that the world can be able to understand. And so now, and now what we have is the, we have the, the reinstitution of the apostle and prophet now in place giving the instructions so that the rest of the fivefold ministry can be able to receive it. So now we are on one accord. And this is the whole purpose of Christ reinstituting and bringing back up these two key uh, gifts. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, please forgive me my... Uh, my windpipes are a little bit on the dry side. I might need a plumber. <laughs> so my second point is this. Jesus started with a small group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to take it back to, uh, to Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 13 through 19. 
When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And he saith unto them, But who do you say that I am? <laughs> and Simon Peter, the one with two left feet, always bold, never cold, <laughs> Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So before I get to this point, uh, I want to go back to, to that word, familios. So, Apostle Andrew has been uh, dealing with uh, uh, Apostle. I'm not really going to deal too much about Apostle, but I'm just going to give roughly a, a, loose, a loose definition of what an Apostle is. Apostle is an emissary. Um, um, his, his, uh, his title is Apostolos. They had in uh, Greece uh, apostles. They also in Rome had apostles. I'm going to use the Roman definition of apostle uh, for, uh, for this illustration. So the Roman apostle, he's kind of Caesar's or the emperor's right hand man. And whenever the emperor wants to expand his kingdom, whenever the emperor wants to expand his kingdom, he would send out an apostle. And he says, okay, here's my sphere of influence. I want it to go this way. I want it to go this way. I, I want it to go all, yes. I want it to go all over the place. I want my name to be made known. So he sends out the apostles. And I call them the right-hand man because of the authority that has been entrusted with them. And what they would do is that they would spy out that land, much like how Joshua and the ten spies, Joshua, Caleb, and the ten spies did. It's kind of like, kind of like that. They would spy out that land. They would take observations. They would do their homework, so to speak, and then they would impose the will of Caesar on that land. And they would set shop up in every area of life. And so the idea behind apostle is that when the emperor comes, it would, that new founded uh, land and territory would look exactly like the place where he came from, which in this case was Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. We kind of see with this illustration how God is wanting to take and expand the kingdom and make it a place where he can call home. Mm -hmm. mm. And so now dealing with Matthew chapter 16, we see a very interesting situation here. And I can, I can pretty much see in the spirit how this kind of went down. Jesus was walking with the apostles, and here is Matthew 16. So it's getting closer to uh, Christ's crucifixion and, and, the, and the passion of, of Christ. And so he wanted to take the temperature of the people and find out exactly what are people saying about them. About him, and so some of them said, you know, you're you're a prophet, you know, you're 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 uh, Elijah, or you're um, you're one of the other other. Um, you, you might even be John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where they came up with that, but Peter, he was bold as a lion, and he said, you are the Christ. Now, what's interesting, I'm going to kind of deviate from my notes here. Nathan, when Jesus called Nathaniel, Nathaniel, after Jesus gave him a word of knowledge, said, you're the Christ. And Jesus, he marveled, and he said, you're telling me I'm the Christ? 
because of a word of knowledge? He says, stick around because you're going to see heaven open. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because he was a true Israelite. Jesus even said that he had no guile. In other words, he followed Torah. He followed Pentateuch. He followed the spirit of Judaism. And he recognized the Christ. And so Jesus said, you're going to see a whole lot more when you stick around with me. Mm -hmm. mm. But what made Peter's discovery more interesting is because maybe Peter, and I'm not assuming here, maybe Peter wasn't following the law, or maybe he just received that revelation from the Father. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ said. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. But my Father, apostolic ministry is the ministry to the Father. It's to bring people closer to the Father. And check this out. Jesus said, because you've got this revelation now, this key, he says, I'm going to give unto you power. I'm going to give you authority here on earth and in heaven. Okay? He says, upon this revelation of me, I'm going to build my church. Oh, hallelujah. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus, I'm in the midst. If two or three are gathered here, which there is more today, how much power do we have in rural Lord court? And so this leads me up to my next point. I'm going to define church. This is a very interesting word because it also, like apostolos, is secular. It is defined as ecclesia or ecclesia. And so ecclesia is a governing body of people, not necessarily believers. We know ecclesia in the context of church, but it was actually a governing body of people that went into every sphere of life to bring law and order according to apostolos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so now, because of apostolos, now the ecclesia can be able to influence with that revelation knowledge every sphere of life. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so now is time when the pace is going to be picked up. Okay? So I want to take you to the book of Acts. The apostles carried on the work. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 34. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of the lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Hallelujah. Yes. And so what we have here is a very interesting uh, piece of, 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 um, of fact. Now at this time, you know, Apostle Peter, he preached, he, you know, they already had Pentecost, you know, uh, 5,000 getting saved. You know, and the church of Jesus Christ is already in full workings. And now Jesus is demonstrating his lordship in their lives through the representatives of apostolos. And as a result, great power was given to the apostles because they were all like Okay, so on the day of Pentecost, they were on one accord. They were in the spirit. They were ministering unto the Lord. And then they heard a mighty rushing wind. And then uh, tongues of fire came on them. And they all spoke the mysteries of God. And so we see the baptism of the Holy Ghost taking place. And this same baptism of the Holy Ghost is now taking it one step further. 
And now he's giving, uh, he's giving great grace to the apostles as witnesses. And so as a result, people were getting saved. Salvation was taking place. Miracles, healings. I'm talking about all kinds. Of, if you can imagine it, it was taking place. Why? Because God, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Yeah. God was getting people to the point where now he was starting to gather them to himself. Yeah. And he's using the, the five-fold minute. He's using uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the grace gifts of Christ. His mantle broken into five different key areas yeah. to bring people unto himself. Yeah. And check this out. Great grace was upon them all. And so during this period of time, Rome was getting very itchy. And the surrounding, uh, you know, Rome, Rome was the dominating uh, factor. They had so much control. And they thought, everyone thought that Christ was going to liberate uh, the Israelites from Roman's power. But that wasn't the case. God was trying to use Christ. God was using Christ to liberate people from sin, from the bondage of sin. Because how many of you know that whatever situation that we find out, it's passing. But what lasts, what you have from Christ, that's what lasts forever. And so as a result of this grace that was given, they all had everything in common. They possessed a spirit of unity like 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 this world has not seen. And so the emergence of the apostolic centers and training centers and whatnot, God is going to start um, releasing this type of grace. And so, you know, in the introduction of today's messages, you know, I define era as, let me go back to this one, I don't mess it up. Uh, I said that era is a period marked by distinctive character or reckon from a fixed point or event because of what's taking place now in the body of Christ the apostolic training the apostles and prophets now are on one accord and now they're able to call into existence things that are not even though that they are they're starting to align through their teaching through their prophet through the familias, through the foundation that they lay of Jesus Christ, that are calling all of the believers unto Christ. They're aligning the pipework so that the anointing of God can flow in full force. I don't know about you, but I like to take a shower, and I like to be clean. I'm not trying to get funky here, but we cannot get clean on a drop here or a drop there. No, we need full pressure. And it's only full pressure by which we're able to get the jump off. And so because of the power that God is going to be releasing, we have people out there who are dirty. And even people in the church who are dirty, they need to get clean. Oh, hallelujah. They need the full power of God. They need all of us working together in unity. Every single last one of us in this room are here today because you are hungry. You are hungry more for the Lord because you want to see something new. What you see with your eyes, what's going on in this world, what's going on in the church, you know that there's something more. There's something different. This is the dawn of a new era. Today we're making history. We're not reading history. We're making it. What God is getting ready to do in these last days of times is going to take the world by storm. The Lord started dealing with me about, about, let me, uh, he started dealing with me about, um, my goodness, help me hold those. So basically, Old Testament was, um, uh, was, uh, was written in New Testament. The uh, Jesus and the apostles wrote the New Testament from the Old Testament. Um, please forgive me. I'm going to go ahead and scratch that. But basically, what took place in the old times, 
Jesus was able to teach from that and establish the new then. But what took place then was a, thank you, Holy Ghost, was a type and foreshadow of things to come. So what took place back 2,000 years ago was a type and shadow of what's getting ready to take place. For example, we see in Matthew, what, chapter, not, not Matthew, chapter four, we see the, uh, forgive me, we see the uh, marriage supper at Cana, right? And here, this was before Jesus actually launched the ministry. And so they were having a good time, and, you know, well, they ran out of wine. They didn't have the plumber in, uh, in, the, in the house. <laughs> and, um, and so they ran out of wine. And so Jesus' mother, I got one up my sleeve, says, Jesus, son, they're out of wine. And Jesus like, no, you did. Mom, you, mom, how many times did I tell you? Mom, <laughs> you know, mom. And then that little twinkle in Jesus' eye gave way to the twinkle that was in Mary's eye. And she turned to the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And it turns out that Jesus manifested his first miracle, turning water into wine. He saved the best for last. He didn't serve the cheap stuff. He served the best stuff. That is a type of and uh, type and shadow of what's getting ready to take place. The marriage has already taken place. We're consummated, but we ran out of the old stuff and then the good stuff, and now we're out, but we're still thirsty. We still want more. But in these days and times that are coming upon us, in the days, weeks, months, and even years, God is going to be, as we are aligning ourselves with Him and coming together by His Holy Spirit, great grace and great power is going to be given. And He, he is going to turn the pressure all the way up because He is sick and tired. I hate to say it like this, but He is sick and tired of His people going astray. And he's tired of the, the, the religions of the world not doing their job and reconciling them back to God. God is a supernatural being. And we were created after a supernatural God. Yeah. Why? Okay, so like for example, we have Elaine Caron. I hipped Apostle Andrew to this. And he was a pastor up in Canada. And he said, you know, and he, he was under the pastoral model. And he said to his congregation, why am I preaching this word of God and not seeing these things take place? And he was just confounded. And so he sought the Lord. And I'm basically just consolidating everything. He sought the Lord. And he said, he said you know what? We're going to go through the book of Acts. We're going to see what's going on. And so within two years, he preached and he taught and he laid the foundation of the book of Acts. And that church changed. And as a result, their whole community is transformed. I'm talking about drug addicts getting off of drugs. We're talking about, oh, homeless people having homes. We're talking about great grace. We're talking about great, lots of miracles taking place. So if God did it for them there, why cannot God do that here? Now, I'm not new to these streets. I've lived here for about 20 years of my life. I've been in ministry here for about 18 years. I've gone up and down uh, the East Coast, ministering, co-ministering, and serving the people. And they tell me all the time, the, the, the people who's been here for long, their tradition has told me, and, and they said this, they said, you can't win. It's a stronghold here. I beg to differ. Mm. What God is doing now? <laughs> I told Andrew a couple years ago, maybe, maybe last year, that what he's got inside of him, as well as the other ones that God is raising up, they don't need a hammer. God gave me a vision. Year after year after year, you know, the preachers always preaching the hammer of God's word. But because 
of what Andrew and others like him, they possess a new spirit. And they possess a new, new language. And what they possess now is love. God showed me that hmm, they don't need to be broken up. They're already broken. Now they need to get healed. Now they need to see my grace. Now they need to see my power. They've heard the word for generation after generation. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> now they need to see my word in action. And what God is getting ready to do, folks, He's getting ready to demonstrate His word. We've heard of the revival. The first thing that needs to get revived is the church. Fuchsia, Dr. Fuchsia Pickett, I had a chance when I lived in uh, Naples, Florida, attended uh, New World Ministries, I had a chance to see that, that beautiful woman of God. And she would come in on her, and she just had just a glow about her. And she was about that big around. And she got up to the podium, and she got up there to preach. And as soon as she got done preaching, and as she was preaching that anointing, started to straighten her up and she was hooping around like she was about 10 years old. You couldn't tell the difference between her and a 10 year old. I tell you what, I've never seen anything like it. So she preached, I can't remember when, back in the 80s or 90s, she preached at a woman's conference and God corrected her. She said, she said this, she said, well when the revival comes, God stopped her. God says no. Revival is dealing, you got your terminology wrong. Revival is not dealing with the world. Revival is dealing with the church. Mm -hmm. the church don't want to hear about revival. Why? Because it's going to cause uh, crooked things to walk up straight. Mm -hmm. But what you're really after is the harvest. That's when I send out my spirit to start bringing people to myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now what God is doing is He's lining us all up. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of all this grace and this power and this spirit of unity mm -hmm. that was prevalent back in the early days of the church. A united people mm -hmm. is what God, their plumbing was straight. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this, Acts 6, and you don't have to turn here, Acts 6, the formation of leadership structure took place. Acts 6 through 8, Stephen, who was a deacon, according to Acts 6, received a similar anointing as an apostle. He preached and he called those religious leaders everything but a child of God in righteousness. Acts 8, there was great persecution. But how many of you know, because of the grace of God <laughs> present in the midst, Saul, <laughs> the number one persecutor of the church, not saved. So no matter what you are going through in this life, though you may have hell and high water coming at you, God's grace is more than sufficient, and he's with us. Now we have become the spiritual Emmanuel. That's why we're called Christians. Christians were called Christians. You know, the believers were called Christians in Antioch. It was actually a sarcastic uh, language, but it kind of fits. God being with us. So we are a spiritual Emmanuel. God is with us, God is in us, and God is working through us. And so I'm going to bring your attention as we begin to wrap this thing up. Um, I want to draw your attention to Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3. Now, now they were in, uh, in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Here's Saul, the persecutor of the church now and the congregation of the saints. And as they ministered before the Lord, and fasted, the Holy Ghost says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. 
And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on, they sent them away. And because now, from, from the time that Jesus left to now, the formation of the church structure, the grace of God working in that and through that, now we see at Antioch a second apostolic center. The first one was Jerusalem. They had all 12 of the apostles, except for Judas, which Matthias was, uh, they cast lots, and basically they put him in. And that church was powerful because of what they contributed. That is the anointing that was on the grace that was on them, gave them flavor. They were able to contribute. And so now, about 300 miles away in Antioch, in Turkey, mm -hmm. now we're seeing a duplication of what was taking place in Jerusalem. <laughs> so they fasted, they prayed, they laid their hands, they sent them away. Now we see the Holy Spirit speaking. Now he's being directed because they're all in one accord. Now he's directing people's steps. This is the thing that God has been wanting to do for ages and ages and ages and ages, but wasn't able to do because of religion, because of tradition of men. And I'm not knocking traditions of men, some, but if it gets in the way of your relationship with Christ, that's an idol. That's an idol. And so from this point on, the apostles were beginning to see the template that was demonstrated in, in Jerusalem and now Antioch. They were able to see the template from which the Lord Jesus and the Father by the Holy Spirit has sent. And as a result, Acts 11, missions became common operation. The apostles, according to Acts 11 through 16, the apostles had spread out everywhere. And I can kind of see in my mind's eye <laughs> that they said, now I see how this is working. Now I want to go into this region. I want to go into this region. They all left. And they all started to evangelize and sharing the grace and the salvation and the hope that lies inside of them, which is Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now we see the Apostle Paul coming about in Acts 17.1. And now the tide is turning. The Apostle Paul now says, basically, now the structure is set. Now let me put the meat on the bones. Can these dry bones live? I say yes. So we see the rest of the book of Acts further giving evidence to the inner workings of the apostolic function. Now that everything is in line, the grace can now flow. Now we can all be on one accord. Now we can all draw everyone Jesus Christ. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Let me put it to you in today's terminology. There's no difference between um, Baptist and Pentecostal. There's no difference between Catholic and non-denomination. We all have our part to play in this. And to conclude, I was given in 2015 a vision, a vision that God used to send me to South Carolina. And I had a vision of a full circle. I saw South Carolina written inside of it. And I understood what God was saying to me and that I need to uproot and go where God has sent me, sent me, sending me. But the full circle thing puzzled me. I'm like, you know, introspecting a little bit. Could this mean my feeling? Could this mean me? Could this mean, you know, the situations I came out of? What does this mean? So, but as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And so God led me to this rabbi by the name of Jonathan Kahn. I don't know if anyone's heard of uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. I, at this point in time, had, had heard of him. But that man is a rabbi of rabbis. He, I believe, has an Issachar anointing, an anointing to tell times and seasons. But what makes him even more unique is that he's messianic. Mm -hmm. 
So his plumbing is 